So uh, welcome everyone to the public information session and orientation to the City of Cote St. Luke's Emergency Preparedness Plan. My name is Jordy Richardson. I'm the Director of Public Safety. Our Public Safety Department in Cote St. Luke consists of four uh, active and very active divisions. Our Emergency Medical Services, Public Security, our Citizens on Patrol Program, our Dispatch Center, and the fifth all-encompassing is Emergency Preparedness. Um, so anything to do with emergency preparedness, disaster planning, call it what you will, is going to be covered this evening. Uh, to begin, I'd like to welcome our mayor, Anthony Housefather, as well as the city council responsible for emergency preparedness, Glenn J. Nashen, to come and uh, welcome everyone. Um, I am very pleased that at the long-standing request of Toby Shulman, we have followed through um, on having a public meeting related to our emergency plan. I think it is very important for Cote St. Luke residents to be aware of the emergency plan that is constantly being updated and to understand what their roles and responsibilities are in an emergency. Because the city can only do so much. We prepare, we plan, we provide, but residents also need to do their part, follow directions and understand how to act in emergencies. We all had the example in 1998 of the ice storm, which was an occasion where I was a counselor at the time in Hampstead, but both Cote St. Luke and Hampstead opened up shelters and actually had to care for people who were without electricity, without care because of the ice storm. And I think it taught us a lot, a, a lesson, a very valuable lesson for all elected officials and people involved in emergency response in our territory because you had a wide-scale emergency that went well beyond our borders. And so you really had to rely on yourselves to get things done. So ever since then, um, certainly I as elected official have felt a very important one of my roles is to make sure that we are provided for in the case of an emergency. I think we have a counselor here, Glenn J. Nashin, who has emergency measures as one of his passions. And we have a director, Jordy Rickson, that has emergency measures as one of his passions, so it's good. We have two very passionate men who are here to give their view about how to deal with an emergency plan. Uh, Jordy is taking this very seriously. You'll note he's wearing full uniform today. Um, but, but, but I think, hopefully, what I'd like to see come out of this is that everyone walks away from today feeling, one, reassured that Code St. Luke has a comprehensive an updated emergency plan. Two, leaves here with a better understanding of what potential emergencies we can face here in Cote St. Luke and how we intend to respond to them. And number three, and most importantly, what your individual role is as a resident in preparing for an emergency and in following instructions given by the city or other emergency services in the context of an emergency. So, uh, Jordy, um, I'll turn this back to you, but Glenn, did you uh, want to come up? So before turning it back to Glordy, to Glordy? <laughs> Oy vey. <laughs> I've merged Glenn and Jordy into one. Uh, before turning it back to Jordy, let me introduce Glenn, who will now talk about his role, I guess, in developing this emergency plan that he's been involved in for now about 25 years. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, in fact, uh, my nickname when I was growing up was Nashin with a Passion. Now you know what my real passion is and it's been emergency preparedness. In fact, it's been more than 25 years. So first of all, Coates and Luke has been renowned as being a leader, a chef de file, a leader in terms of emergency preparedness, uh, public safety, disaster planning for the better part of 52 or 53 years right now when our EMO started back in the early 60s. Uh, I've been, I feel a little bit old saying it, but I've been involved now for 35 years in emergency preparedness in Coates St. Luke, and just a couple years after that was joined by Councillor Ruth Kovac, uh, both of us getting involved uh, at a very, very much younger age uh, in the, uh, what was then EMO, uh, which was an offshoot of civil protection from those of you that will remember back to uh, the preparedness that took place uh, following World War II uh, during the Cold War. And the signs uh, that were up at 8100 in those days, which Jordy has in our virtual museum, are those original civil protection signs that you'd see across the United States and Canada pre preparing for the inevitable, which never came, but it uh, gave us a culture and a reason to prepare for things that were far more 
prevalent than, than things happening in Russia, it was things happening right here. And that's what Jordi's gonna talk to you about uh, this evening. So I've volunteered ever since, together with Ruth, we've been partners in emergency preparedness for, for, for these many decades. And as the emergency preparedness chairman, uh, it's my role and responsibility, as the mayor was indicating, to ensure that we uh, meet as a committee, which includes uh, professional staff people, such as Jordi and other uh, emergency um, 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 staffers like police, fire department, and others, members of council, technical experts, people who have either an engineering background or other technical expertise, as well as members of the public who bring forward uh, their interests and their, and their concerns. And so we discuss, we review, we plan, and we've been doing this for decades. Jordi and I have been involved uh, first as volunteers when I originally met him, and then as a, as a professional staff person for, for many, many years that we've worked uh, side by side. But the plan that Jordi will present is a plan that's really been in, um, in a state of um, preparedness, a state of uh, evolution for many decades and has improved over the years. So with all this practice, whether it's the floods or the ice storms that the mayor mentioned, whether it's heat waves or other things, we try to meet to mitigate these, uh, these inconveniences, serious inconveniences to you, um, the residents, and we spend a lot of time doing that. And Ruth and I have lived uh, with the mayor and with other members of council through many serious emergencies over the decades. Jordi's going to touch on that now. And um, at th this point, I'd like to pass it on to Jordi, who oversees not only our emergency preparedness plan, but all the services, both volunteer and professional, that he's mentioned. And Ruth and I, the mayor, Jordi, have worked with an incredible group, and I, I just want to pay uh, 10 seconds of tribute to our volunteers. We have many of them, about 80 on the EMS side, about 80 on the VCOP side, and many more others in different groups around the city that really come out and, and do their utmost to make sure that Cote St. Luke is an extremely safety-oriented, emergency preparedness-oriented uh, community. And we're really indebted to, to all of them for the incredible work that they've done in the past, together with our professional, uh, Jordi, who leads us uh, in, this, in this effort. And I'm going to pass it over to Jordi, who's going to walk us through the emergency plan, and, uh, we'll, and we will all take your questions afterwards. Thank you, the other half of Glory. <laughs> so when we talk about uh, emergencies, the mayor mentioned the ice storm, uh, Councillor Nash mentioned, mentioned a few others, but it's important when we think back that emergencies aren't those once-in-a-lifetime events anymore. They happen more and more frequently. This picture, thankfully, it just, it may, it's a really cool picture, uh, is not a local emergency that we've had to deal with, at least not in, in Canada or North America recently. But here are some examples that have. Lac Megantic, plane crash in San Francisco. This was the Coteau du Lac, the uh, fireworks explosion uh, two summers ago. Wildfires in northern Quebec. Flooding in Calgary, riots when the Vancouver Canucks were eliminated from the Stanley Cup. You can just imagine what would have happened if had they won. Uh, heat waves is something that we've dealt with over the last three summers where we have consistent heat over 33 degrees Celsius for a prolonged period of time. Uh, there was a, an outbreak of Legionnaire's disease, in, Legionnaire's disease in Quebec City two years ago that killed 13 people. And of course, we all remember the water boiling advisory that affected 1.3 million Montrealers uh, not that long ago. One of the big ones, uh, obviously, is, is natural disasters, something that we talk about a lot. And I, I was at a conference where the Institute for Catastrophic Loss Reduction, if I got that correctly, um, which is a think tank of people dealing with emergency preparedness and uh, meteorolo meteorologists, uh, came out with a statistic that out of the, in the last 100 years, 17 of the top 25 mega disasters were climate related. Meteorologists in Canada are predicting that by 2050, there will be a four to six time increase in the number of hot days, which is the temperature, sustained temperature over 30 degrees Celsius, and a 50% increase in freezing rate episodes lasting more than four hours. This is a chart that shows the total of natural disasters in Canada by decade. So as you can see, it is a very clear exponential growth. Now, the last column looks really small. We think, okay, well, 
we're doing something right. Unfortunately, that only accounts for two years. These are decadal numbers. So the last column is just for 2010 and 2011. If we multiply that by five to expand it over a 10 year period, we'll see that that trend will continue. So what are we gonna do? We're gonna plan for disaster now. So let's get started. The question is how do we do that? What, one of the things that we have in Cote St. Luke that makes us unique is we already have a very emergency-minded city, a very emergency-oriented system. Thanks in large part to our EMS, our public security, our VCOP, we're already in an emergency frame of mind. How do we expand that and build what we call disaster DNA? And that's why the DNA molecule Okay, fine, it's an artistic rendition thereof, but we want to build in each and every one of our residents, in each and every one of our staff, in each and every one of our volunteers, this disaster DNA. How do we do that? It's in part by tools, like our emergency preparedness plan is a, is a confident, confidential document in that it contains uh, certain confidential information, uh, but we have our emergency preparedness plan. We also developed Something, this is more for the inner workings of the city, but a facility emergency plan. This deals more with something that wouldn't require calling out the cavalry, but when we have a flood in a building, when we have a gas leak, when we have a smaller incident confined to one space, we want to make sure that that disaster DNA is built in to all of our staff, all of our volunteers, and all of our residents. In addition to that are all the tools that we're bringing to the table and as Councillor Nash mentioned, we have over the years implemented a number. There's some more that we are in the process of implementing including one that we're going to announce this evening. Um, a quote that I, that I heard and, and really stuck is that problems don't get solved by writing things down, they get solved by taking action. So while it is important to have strong documents, and we do, and we're constantly updating them, it's what's in here that's gonna help us because when disaster strikes, the chances are we're gonna rely on our reflexes, on, on what we've learned, what we've been taught, and not necessarily go back and read the book to say, oh, okay, train derailment, chapter seven, what do I do? So that's, it, it all comes back to building that community DNA, that disaster DNA, and we can't do this alone. It's not me speaking to those of you who gave up your evening and we appreciate it to come out tonight. It's really a whole community approach. It's the city, it's the citizens, it's our partners, it's the private sector, it's faith-based groups, it's special needs groups, it's every one of our, whether it's a, a, a social club, whether it's the sisterhood or the men's club of our synagogue, having the opportunity to talk to learn about emergency preparedness that we will help to develop that DNA across the city. What can you do as an individual resident, and this is really one of the important things, is the three steps as part of the 72-hour Get Prepared program. Know the risks, and we're gonna talk about those tonight, what the risks that we've identified in Cote St. Luke as being the most probable, or those which require the most targeted response. We're gonna make a plan, and again, each one of us as individuals should also know the risks that affect, what affects me, what affects my family, what affects my house. Make a plan to deal with that and get a kit. Make sure that we have the tools, the resources available, whether it's on the micro scale, me and my house, or the macro scale, us and our city, in order to do that. And of course, there are resources available. We have, for example, the 72 hour get prepared uh, documentation in the entrance to City Hall. It's on, available online and certainly encourage all of our residents to, uh, to learn more about that. Let's talk about the plan itself. The plan deals with the four cycles or the four steps of the emergency preparedness cycle. Mitigation or prevention, how do you reduce the risks? Preparedness, how do you prepare to deal with the risks you can't mitigate. Response, how do we deal with an incident? And recovery, how do we get ourselves back to normal? And our emergency preparedness plan deals with that. The objective of the plan is to empower the city to protect the people, preserve the environment, and promote continued well-being during emergency situations affecting the city. It's a multidisciplinary, so 
it's not one department or one silo. It really is multi multidisciplinary across the city. And it's designed in such a way that if something were to happen and I, you know, I'm the first uh, victim of the zombie apocalypse, well, the plan, I can give this to, well, anyone but Toby because she won't give it back. But be able to, and I, I'm just kidding, Toby, um, would be able to take this plan and deliver the emergency response to the city. So it talks a little bit about the introduction to the city, the organization, the geography, the, geography, the size, the road network, um, the population, and so on. Again, so that anyone could walk in and know that there are how many schools in Cote St. Luke? Come on, someone just... 10. There are 10. We have how many hospitals? We have seniors residences. One thing that people uh, don't often realize is we are actually under a flight path. In Cote St. Luke is under the flight path of runway 1028. And if you really want to know how runways are numbered, I can tell you about it after the presentation. But it's the third runway at Pierre Le Trudeau Airport, and it does go over Cote St. Luke. So really to understand uh, the geography and dealing with it throughout, throughout me plugging back in the cable, and dealing with the different cycles of the emergency. So far, so good? So what are the risks? We talk about knowing the risks. What are the risks that we've identified? Now, risks really are, are categorized in three ways. You guys can hear me if I'm away from the mic? Yeah. All right. So, we typically divide risks into three categories. There are the routine emergencies. Those are the ones, if anyone here lives on, these, you know, on the banks of a river, you expect that during the spring thaw, the water levels will come up. There's a risk that your house gets flooded. We don't have that in Cote St. Luke because the lake in Trudeau Park has yet to overflow its banks. But those who live, for example, along Gwain Boulevard, along the northern edge of, uh, of the island of Montreal, deal with that. It's something where there is a certain routine that gets built in. Then we have our crisis emergencies, our crisis risk, train derailment, plane crash, something that happens right now. And we, how we deal with that is similar but not the same. And then we have what we define as emergent risks. Something that we can see coming and developing over time. Who can give me a, a very live example, one that we're dealing with worldwide right now? Ebola. Ebola. Terrorism is also a good one, but terrorism, I would categorize more as a crisis because we don't have the ability to predict it. But Ebola, for example, people at the World Health Organization and Health Canada are tracking the progression of that disease and watching its evolution. So how we deal with them is different, not just from the point of mitigation, preparedness, response, and recovery. Because someone, for example, who uh, lives on the, the, the bank of the, um, the back river, I sound like my grandparents, um, the uh, Riviera de Milil, who gets flooding every spring, the impact, the long-term impact, not the same. Let's compare that with a resident who lives in, in or near downtown Lac Megantic. The recovery, the same? It's not. So that when we're dealing and planning for these events, we, it's a different response throughout that entire cycle. So let's talk about the risks. And the risks in our plan are defined, are numbered 1 to 10, in terms of the highest to the lowest perceived frequency. That, that's not to say that number 10 could happen tomorrow and number one could not happen for a long, long time. But within each one of the risks, we talk about the domino effect. So if incident A happens, what else could happen associated with that event? What are the impacts on people? What are the impacts on infrastructure? And what are our considerations, both short-term and long-term, to deal with those? Because what we need today in terms of equipment and manpower and, and, and supplies and what we need over the recovery period, very different. So let's talk about them. The first one, weather. We talked about this at the outset. Natural disasters are a risk. They're an omnipresent risk. They are an increasing risk. So we've identified weather. Whether it's hot or cold, the fact is that either one requires specific responses. Because yes, it's important. Sorry, I'm closer to the mic. Um, 
while it's important to deal with the ice storm, the heat wave is also important and brings with it different, uh, different risks. Infrastructure. We have seen over, over and over again, and not just in Montreal, not just in Cote Saint-Luc, and not just in Montreal, and certainly not even in Canada, but across North America, we've seen an under a growth in the infrastructure in the 60s, an underinvestment in the maintenance of that infrastructure over the following decades. And now we have a problem where we have crumbling infrastructure above ground as well as below ground, and now we have a lot of patching up to do. So we need to plan and deal with risks to our infrastructure. Terror, uh, Joel mentioned it before, we live in a society where there's a possibility of terror. And it could be, it's not necessarily ISIS, it could be a school shooter, and we've seen these incidents, unfortunately, we've seen them right here in Montreal, we've seen them across Canada, we've seen them in the United States, where these, and across the world, where given our specific demographics in certain parts of Cote St. Luke, it is a risk. I'm not saying we don't have any information that says there's an imminent risk, but it's something that we need to plan and prepare for. Rail. Who here lives in, who lives in Cote St. Luke and doesn't need, live near enough to a train or a train line that this clearly is something that we need to deal with? And we're going to talk about trains in a little bit more detail uh, later on. Water. So water is, could be one of two things. We can either have a lack of water or we can have a contamination of our water supply. Those who will remember, we had a preventative water boiling advisory that affected 1.3 million people living on the island of Montreal. Now, thankfully, it was preventative. What happens if it would have been real? What happens if our drinking water would have been contaminated? And what are the repercussions? Forget citywide. Think each one of us as an individual. My house, my household, I need to brush my teeth and drink and make coffee um, and live my life and bathe and so on and so forth. What would the implications be for each one of us as individuals if we have no drinking water, and now expand that across 32,321 residents, and that's what we've covered in our plan. Power. Good to have, bad to not have, really bad to not have when it's combined with something else. If we don't have power right now, okay, so we'd all stumble to our cars and, you know, we'd make it home and we may have to park on the street with a permit, um, and it wouldn't be so bad, right? What happens if it's minus 30? Different story. Those of us who heat with electricity, now we're, 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 we're seeing how the risks, it's not one silo, it's really, it's an evolution and, and a domino effect. What happens if it's plus 30? What happens if it's 30, you know, 30 degrees and all of a sudden we don't have air conditioning? Well, the Cavendish Mall would be very happy because we'd all go there, but what happens if they don't have air conditioning either? Just think, again, how each one of these incidents really has a large effect. Health. We talked about uh, Ebola and we've seen pandemics and epidemics over the years, H1N1, H5N2. S scientists come up with all kinds of cool names. Uh, SARS, there have been different risks that's something that obviously we need to plan for. Let's take an example in the city. Um, we all live in Cote, or we all live in Cote St. Luke or deal with Cote St. Luke. What happens if uh, we have a health epidemic that affects city staff? Well, it affects residents. Let's say 50% of our residents are sick. That means that, according to the same calculations, 50% of our staff is sick. How do we collect the garbage? Again, something we don't think about, but take a look in the city of Toronto a few years ago when they had a garbage strike, the chaos that that caused because no one was able to pick up the garbage, the health risks that that created because no one was picking up the garbage. So this is something that as a city, for the city to continue to offer services and to our residents, is something we need to take into consideration. Technology. Um, most of us would be totally lost without our cell phone. All those in, in favor with that statement? Yeah. So again, what happens if there's a, a technology failure? What happens if we can't f call? If you think about it, again, for a few hours, not the, end of the not the end of the world, but all of a sudden, you know, 
Our vulnerable uh, seniors, for example, who live at home, whose kids may live out of town, need to speak to mom and dad, make sure that they're okay, make sure they're taking their medic medication. There's a lot of snowball effects that could come with a, with a technology failure. Fire, obviously, being one, uh, a major risk. Um, again, how this affects the impact on the individual, on the family, and on the infrastructure of the city is something that we deal with in our plan. And the last is, um, is, air, is the fact that we are under a, a flight path. It's not one that's used often, but it is used depending on which way the wind is blowing, uh, literally, not figuratively. Um, it's something that we certainly have to contend with. Let's talk about our emergency preparedness plan in a little bit more detail. And Councillor Nashton alluded to it before. We have an emergency preparedness committee which consists of technical experts, people with a specialty in the milieu, as well as residents. And we meet to make sure that our plan is up to date, that it meets the needs of our residents, and we make any uh, and all modifications. We do a lot of training. We're training all of, we're retraining all of our city staff. We're training all of our volunteer groups. We're training uh, those residents that, uh, that are here and those that will learn about this through, uh, you know, through, through whether through the media or the, the city's communications. Um, we've really invested a lot in 2014, especially we made it the year of emergency preparedness in Cote Luc, and we've made it a lot, uh, we've updated our infrastructure. Um, we're also working on and developing a crisis communication plan to make sure that when those incidents happen, we have a succinct way to communicate to all of our residents. Whether it's something as small as a facility is closed down or you know, we had to close the library because there was a, a pipe that burst and, and there was a, a flood here in this building uh, a few months ago. So again, it's not something that, that is catastrophic. No one, thankfully, is going to suffer because they can't take out their library book that day. But again, as a city and as a provider of services to our residents is something that we need to, to take into consideration. So how does the plan itself work? Within the plan, everyone has a role to play. And that starts with the elected officials, our mayor and our council. They adopt the plan. They approve it uh, at public meetings. They, um, uh, they appropriate budgets in order to allow us to have the tools and build the tools and, and be able to communicate with our residents. We have an emergency measures coordinator who uh, is usually me. When I'm not available, the city manager is the, the backup and the associate city manager is the second backup. And that's one thing that is important in our plan is that every position has an alternate and most of them have a second alternate to make sure that if I'm not here, the show still can go on. Because we can't have a plan that relies on one person. With that, it falls apart if that one person is not available. But again, by having different people, different actors at every level, that's how we ensure our success. This obviously, and I, I alluded to, to it before, is not something that Cote St. Luke can do on its own. We deal with partners. We deal with the Montreal Police Department, the Fire Department, Urgent Santé, uh, Canadian Pacific Police. We deal with the CSSS, the Centre de Santé Service Socio Cavendish. We work in partnership with these organizations. And when we meet, these people are at our table to make sure that we really cover all of the aspects that we can cover. We also have a, a strong relationship and. A, a certain degree of interdependence on the Centre de Sécurité Civile, which is the Montreal agglomeration level uh, organization that when a disaster exceeds either our borders or our ability to cope, they're the first, or they're essentially the second line of defense and the provincial government's the third and can go all the way up to the federal government to make sure that we have the tools and the, the resources available to provide for you guys, our residents. So, the team itself, uh, this is probably what it would look like, although I think our table is a little bit bigger. Um, in our plan, we talk about, there are essentially two decision centers. There's the emergency operations center, which is where the key decision makers decide what are the strategies, what's the plan, what are we going to do to respond to an emergency. And there's the site, or 
depending on the incident, there can be multiple sites. So we ensure through regular communications with our site to our emergency operations center to make sure that we know what's going on in the field and we can best plan our response. Obviously, on site, whether it's a small incident or a large incident, we work hand in hand with our partners, again, whether it's the police department, the fire department, to make sure that we are off, able to offer, in addition to the services that are offered to all residents, for example, the island of Montreal by the fire department, what additional services can we, can we as Cote St. Luke offer to our residents and make sure that those are delivered? What do we actually do? I mean, so far it's, it's, been, it's been fun and it's been good and, and in theory it makes sense, but what are we, what are we doing on scene? So every demerged city and every borough on the island of Montreal is responsible for four missions. In Cote St. Luke, given our public safety uh, orientation, we've actually added a, fi a fifth mission, but we are responsible for four, in our case, five key missions. There are others that are not our responsibility. Mass transit, for example, that falls under the Montreal agglomeration. Uh, public health. There are certain dossiers where it's not our, our lead, although we do contribute, but these four, and the one that we've added that we're gonna talk about, really are what we do as a city to deal. So, social services, aide aux personnes sinistrées, are responsible for shelters. We have, in the past, opened shelters for incidents, large and small. The ice storm would probably be the most prevalent example, but we have op open smaller shelters to deal with more local emergencies. How do we do that? How do we set it up? We have a stockpile of cots that can be rapidly deployed. We can open shelters. We have all of the tools in order, if we need to evacuate a segment of the population, we, can, we have where to uh, give them somewhere to sleep, somewhere to eat, somewhere to shower, brush their teeth, and so on and food and drink. Obviously, we need to sustain these people. If you're out of your house, you need to still eat. The city will, will ensure that we have food to feed you and water to, to hide, thank you, Mike, to hydrate you. Uh, and again, we do that with partnerships with local, uh, local businesses. Public works, access and roads, so public, the city is responsible for making sure that we have access and egress in the event of a disaster. Now that could be something from uh, clearing roads, clearing snow, installing barricades to deviate the flow of traffic, and we're gonna talk about our evacuation routes shortly, but that's a responsibility in, in this case of public works. Energy, if, God forbid, there was a major power failure, we have generators, mobile generators, including one that's trailer mounted, that we can deploy as, as we see fit to a site, to a shelter site, for example, to make sure that we have power to keep the lights on and the food and the, uh, the air warm. Transportation, again, this can be transportation of people or transportation of goods. One thing that came up during the, the, uh, the report that followed the ice storm was that, and again, I, I apologize, I don't remember what exactly it was, but there was a company that was willing to donate a large supply of X, and I apologize, I don't remember, I think it was towels or blankets or something, of, something that was desperately needed. The problem is they had no one to drive the truck. So we need to make sure that we can, if there are supplies that we need, we need to be able to go and get them. We need to be able to move people around, move goods around, and that's something that the city takes on as a responsibility. Technical inspections as far as making sure that more so as we're into the recovery phase of an incident that our buildings are safe, that our roads are safe, and that's something that, that the city takes as, as a responsibility. Communications, when something happens, who wants to know? Everyone wants to know. So it's important that we have strong communication both to the public through our media partners, but also to internal. It's important that, we, that our staff know what's going on so that we can provide the right information because the last thing we want is to call and, you know, I'm not sure there's an incident or get conflicting information. It's important that 
as a, as a provider of service to you, our residents, it's essential that we have that information that happens internally. We can't have a communication plan that doesn't deal with social media. So what, whatever the incident is, we need to be, make sure that we communicate that and make sure that our technology, our computers, our phones, our so on, are fully functional. Administration logistics is the, the fourth uh, mission, although you know it's the one that it's not as sexy as the others. It is important and essential that we have registration, we have record keeping. We know, for example, how many people came into a shelter, when they came, when they left. Not only so that if someone's coming and looking for a loved one, but also when we do our reports, when we do our statistics, even when we go and claim money that's available from different levels of government to cover costs related to, to emergency response, it's important that we have strong record keeping. Uh, volunteer management. We have a a very well engaged community in Cote Saint Luke, something that we're really privileged with. And those in this room and, and plenty of others, when something happens, we know that there are going to be people step up and say, you know what, I want to help. What can I do? And that's a huge resource for us. We need to be able to record that so that we know, okay, this person's doing this task. Not only to thank them and you know, recognize exemplary service, but also to make sure, listen, you've been on your feet doing registration for six hours. Go take a break. Go take 15 minutes. Take a coffee. Go relax. We'll bring in some, uh, you know, someone else so that we take care of the people who are taking care of our people. And that's something that, that's, uh, that's quite important. Obviously, anything purchasing. If we need, whether it's sandbags to, uh, sandbags to conf control the, the f overflow of Trudeau, Centennial Lake in Trudeau Park, whatever the equipment is that we need, we need to make sure that we're purchasing, that we're keeping strong records of that, and obviously donations. Something, a donation could be monetary, a donation could be items, stuff, a donation in kind. It could be pers a person's time or an expertise that they have, because I, I won't name his name, but I had a I had a, a neighbor. He was a real piece of art. Um, you know what? We didn't really get along. I, I moved away not because of him. But you know what he has in his garage? He has a boat. You've heard this spiel before. He has a boat. So guess what? In the case of an emergency, if, you know, if there was a flood, like we saw in 1986 when the Cary flooded, guess who I want on my team? 80? Sorry, 87. Guess who I want on my team? I want that guy. So again, that's if, some, if someone's willing to donate their goods or their money or their time, that's something that we definitely need to, to take into consideration. Obviously, public safety, our EMS, our public security and VCOP, our dispatch center are all important parts of emergency response. Now let's address the big red train in the room. Happens to be, I, I t I'm not much of a photographer, but I took that picture. I like it. Um, it's something that is a concern for all residents of Cote Luke. Most of us have to drive either under a train yard to get into Cote Luke, next to a train yard. We live near a train. It's something that we, have, that we deal with. Part of Cote Luke is surrounded by trains. Now, we could either panic or we can do what we've done in Cote Luke and done with success is plan, prepare, and develop strong partnerships. We have an excellent working relationship with CP which is the uh, primary rail, uh, the rail company that surrounds us. Uh, we, meet re we meet with them on a regular basis. We exchange information. Uh, I speak with, uh, with the sergeant of the CP police on a regular basis. He was actually supposed to be in attendance this evening, but got called out at the last minute. Um, we share our plans. They have, uh, essentially have a copy of our plan. We have a copy of theirs to make sure that we're in conjunction. We talked a little bit before about evacuation routes. Those of us who know Cote St. Luke well will know that there are four locations in the city where we have an access or egress, depending on the need, through CP territory. Who can tell me what they are? Okay, the yard's there. So 5901 Westminster, which is the entrance to the CP yards past Quality Fruits and the, uh, the, the, the CPE, that's one. Cavendish and Wallenberg. Drive up Cavendish all the way past, all the way to the end, just to your right. 
you'll see there's a green and yellow round sign that can allow us to get out if we need to evacuate to the north. Both of those go to the north and those of us who have either jogged or cycled or trespassed uh, through the CP land know that you can either get out to the 20 on Norman Street or out to Paré towards the Carry uh, if you're dealing with an orange julep emergency. <laughs> now, we also know that we have in, in trail lingo, they call it the Adirondack sub that runs essentially, that's what creates the underpasses or overpasses at Cavendish and at Westminster. There are two access egress routes if we need to get over either north to south or south to north. One is just behind Mount Sinai Hospital. So if you take the little road that leads to the Hydro-Quebec station, there's a, a gate that will get you out to Bailey and Glencrest. Glencrest? Glencrest. Um, again, north-south over the train or next to Yavne School on Wavell, just to the east of the Westminster underpass, there's an access point there that brings you out to Bailey. Now, why is that important to know? Because if ever our underpasses become unusable for, wh for whatever reason, despite the fact that we've invested millions of dollars improving the pumps and ensuring that, that they work efficiently, it is a risk. So if ever we needed to, we can evacuate over whether I said to the north or to the south. Now, the question inevitably is, okay, so which one do I use? And my answer inevitably is, it depends. Because if there's a toxic spill, for example, God, t -t -t -t, knock on wood, everyone invoke your, your, your good luck charms right now, but if ever, God forbid, that were to happen in the yard that's to the north, the last thing we want people to say is, okay, I'm gonna, I was told, Jordy told me, go through the Westminster Gate, because guess what, you're going into trouble. So part of our responsibility is to inform, educate, so that you know that those are available, and when an incident does happen, is to direct residents to the correct route and not just have pandemonium, which is certainly what we're trying to avoid. Um, one last uh, topic on, uh, on the, uh, that's covered in the plan, although it's not certainly the least important, is the recovery. So it's important that we know how to mobilize, how to alert, how to get people in the field doing what they need to do, whether it's registering people at a shelter and feeding them food, whether it's barricading streets so that we know what the evacuation route is. It's important at the end of the process that we demobilize. We say, okay, listen, Joel, you've been doing a great job. You've been doing registration. We're going to close registration at 6 o'clock. Start letting people know, and we're going to start shutting down our shelter site, for example. So that's something that's important for us to know, is how are we going, we've, we've figured out how we ramp up. And again, whether it's if a crisis emergency, remember that that train derailment happens instantaneously. Okay, we go from zero to 100 in, in, in like 60 seconds. How do we now get from 100 back down to zero? How do we go back to normal? if there is such a thing as normal. Because let's take the example of, of Lac Megantic. Is, do, is what they live today the same as what they lived before the train derailment? No. Their lives have not gone back to normal. They're adapting to a, you know, a new normal. So how do we make sure that we have the tools available to debrief our staff, to debrief our volunteers, to debrief our residents, to have the tools to go back to whatever that new normal is. And obviously, how do we, pre we pre gather all that information, prepare a post-mortem so that we know what have we done well, what do we need to improve for the next time, what are our strengths, what are our weaknesses, who are our shining stars that we need to, to recognize and make sure that we capitalize. Every emergency is a learning opportunity. No emergency, no response, will ever be perfect. But if we continue to learn what, from what went well and improve what didn't go also that well, then the next time something happens, regardless of the nature of the emergency, we'll be that much better prepared. So I promise you a launch of something exciting, or at least it's exciting for me and my little emergency brain. So the question is, how do we let our residents know of an incident going on in the city? 
That is not the solution. This, this, is. So tonight we're, we're launching our Coats and Luke alerts. It's our mass notification system. And what this will allow us to do is to notify residents by whatever means they choose of different incidents in the city or affecting the city. That, could, that can be a uh, water main break, for example, on uh, SMART that affects really just one small section of SMART and we need to notify them that they need to boil their water for the next 48 hours so that they don't get sick. Or it could be we, can, we need to notify everyone in the city by text, by email, by phone, through an automated system. This is a tool that we're now pleased to launch to our residents. It's entirely optional. Uh, you opt in with the information that you want. If you want us to communicate with you by email, you put in what methods you want to receive information, and not only that, you choose how you want to receive it. If you want to reach me, anyone who knows me, don't call me at home. I'm never there. If you want to reach me, call me on my cell. I'm going to choose, well, actually, email me first, then send me a text message, and if I don't respond, then call me. Because I'm horrible, and Toby will probably confirm this, I'm horrible with, with returning calls, right? <laughs> But again, this tool will allow the city to communicate with residents. It's a, it's a long story. Allow the city to communicate with our residents, whether it's in a specific area that we define, and essentially uh, the tool will allow us to pull up a map and choose, okay, I, wanna, I can geotrace an area and say, okay, just notify the people in this area. Or I can notify the whole city. We can uh, do it in different, uh, by different uh, by different means. So the website that you see there, coatsandlink.org slash alert, um, Daryl will confirm it's live uh, as of right now. It will bring you, essentially it's, per, it's powered by a third party. Um, you register, you provide all of your information. When it, It's really quite simple and they do provide step-by-step -step instructions. If you have a question in the top right corner, there's a little question mark, you click for help and they'll walk you through it. It's a tool that, again, hopefully we'll never need to use it, but those of us in emergency preparedness know it's not a question of if a disaster will strike, but it's a question of when. So this is an added tool in our arsenal that's gonna help build that disaster DNA that we talked about to make sure that we know the risks, we make our plans, we have our toolkit, we have our resources, and we have the ability to share that information in a timely manner. This system can reach, um, I think we'd said it would take about eight minutes to read, er, reach every resident in Cote d'Ivoire. Considering the water boiling advisory affected 1.3 million people, it took them about six hours to reach a third of that. This is a tool that will allow us to communi communicate quickly and efficiently with our residents to give them timely information that they need to know. So with that, I'll open the floor if there are any questions. Uh, how do we know, uh, was how do we know where to go uh, and whether that can be accomplished or, or augmented by signage uh, is, is an excellent question. Um, we don't have highways where we have large signboards, you know, to indicate an evacuation, but that's where we'll use our notification system to inform residents, for example, uh, evacuate to the south, and these are the options available to you. Now, one thing that I just wanted to point out, in a disaster, evacuation isn't always the answer. There are often times, for example, if there's a toxic leak, where the instructions will be sh what we refer to as shelter in place. Wherever you are, close your doors, close your windows, turn off your air conditioning system, stay inside. So again, that's information that we don't always want you to go somewhere. Sometimes we want you to stay home and take certain precautionary measures, and that's something we'll have the ability to communicate. We're also looking at actually those, you know, like you see them on the side of the highway for construction. Uh, they're a little bit cost prohibitive, but um, it's something that we're certainly looking at in terms of temporary uh, mobile signage that can be deployed, for example, to give uh, specific instructions. That's an excellent what question. 
system in terms of power failure, uh, the, the system that, that drives this doesn't reside in Cote St. Luke. It doesn't even reside in Montreal. There, there, well, one, there are three data centers, Montreal, Toronto, uh, Montreal, Toronto, Vancouver. So as long as we have the ability to make a phone call, then we can launch a notification. Now, ideally, I would do it from my computer, or if my computer doesn't work, I can do it from my iPad. If my iPad doesn't work, I can run it from my cell phone, and if my cell phone really doesn't work, as long as I can get a phone, I can call the, the company that supplies the service, and they can launch it for us, using, obviously, credentials and, 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 and protections. But as long as we have, I can get either to an internet site or to a phone line, I can launch an alert. Now, what happens, you're at home, you only have a house phone, your phone does a ring. I, we're limited, obviously, by certain technology, but I, that's where we encourage people to use different means of communications when they're registering for the system. Put in your email address and your house phone and your cell phone so that we have different ways of getting in touch with you. Most people, and this will just kind of be my, 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 public safety, my public service announcement, how many of us have cordless phones in our house? How many of us know the cordless phones won't work with there's no power? So again, something that's important to have, make sure you have at least one phone, an old-fashioned phone, which is analog and doesn't rely on power. Make sure, and this is something you can get in the documentation about the 72-hour program, Get, make sure you have candles and waterproof matches. You have some, you know, we all talk about everyone has non-perishable food in your house. Make sure you have a can opener that goes right with it because if not, you're going to have a heck of a time trying to open that can of peas without a can opener. So those are the types of things where, the, where you help yourself, which helps us because it comes back to something that, that uh, Councillor Nashen said right at the outset is that in the first 72 hours, the first three days, city services at all levels will be predominantly occupied with dealing with the most critical situations. Which means we may not get to everyone's house, to everyone's door, so people need to develop that disaster DNA and a certain degree of autonomy to be able to take care of themselves for the first 72 hours following, it, following it, an incident. Okay, that's an excellent question. Uh, the question is how do we open those gates? Uh, it, we have a, uh, an agreement with CP um, where essentially every one of those gates has two locks. One that's controlled by the city and one that's controlled by CP. And the reason for that is the last thing we want to do is take people that are leaving a bad situation, bring them over the train tracks only to discover that train traffic has not been halted on the lines. Because now we're taking a bad situation, we're making it worse, much worse. So through our partnership with CP, we'll deploy a resource with our key. They'll deploy a resource with their key. When both locks are open, that means that we know that the trains are not rolling and cars are now free to roll over those crossings. That answers your question? It is a key on a lock, and the lock has a backup lock, or a backup key, which is also in a lock. It's an excellent question. Uh, why, is the, why are the access and egress routes north-south? The fact is that they really technically aren't because once you go into the CP yards, if any of us have ever been there, uh, essentially from there you branch out east and west. But we can only go where there are roads to bring cars. And going, for example, through Meadowbrook won't necessarily... We want to make sure that our access and egress routes bring us to somewhere that can get us away from the incident. So the last thing we want to do is bring people, for example, to the end of Kildare and they just end up turning around in front of Bialik. If ever one day, you know, for example, Kildare connects to Jean Talon, Cavendish connects to Royal Mount and then to Cavendish, uh, if there's ever development in Meadowbrook, and, and I'm not making a political statement for or against any of those other than the Cavendish extension, which I strongly support. Um, but if ever those come to be, then we will add, and that's why the plan is not set in stone. It's constantly being reviewed and reevaluated and updated to make sure that we have the, the latest uh, information. Okay, so I, I'm going to try to answer those in the same order that you asked. It. The key for the underpasses, the, the overpasses essentially, um, we have 
Each one of their public security vehicles has a key. I have one in my car, uh, well, in, in, my, in the public safety vehicle. And we also have a, uh, what's called a rapid access management, a RAM box that contains a backup key that in addition to um, public security, our EMS vehicles have, and certain of the fire trucks have. So we have resources to get those keys out far more rapidly. Now again, I agree with you that an emergency is an emergency, but the necessity to evacuate is not always the same. And again, it depends, you know, if there's an explosion, yes, you want to get out quickly. If there's, you know, a water shortage, the urgency is not there. So that's why it's not a cookie, a, a cookie cutter solution. Each incident, and the plan allows for that, is expandable based on the needs of the incident, the needs of our residents. Did I catch all of them? There's one more. Yes, so there actually are other gates that get in and out of the city. There's one at the north end of Blossom uh, that goes into the CP fence. Uh, there is the one at, uh, at Park Haven and, and, uh, and, um, and Wavell, thank you. Uh, the urban planner in me says, well, that would be a great place to put another access and egress route out of Coatsy and Luke, but there's just, there's no space for it. Um, but again, there are other ways to get into uh, the rail, but again, we've identified these four as being those that are the easiest to cross, those that are the most logical to cross. For example, if you're trying to get from the north of Cote St. Luke towards the south, well, the logical place to put access routes are near the underpasses, which is exactly what we did. That's not to say that there are not other routes, but those are the ones that we've prioritized. So we don't have a radio uh, frequency, you know, like you would see, you know, uh, if you want to know the, the airport, you tune to this channel. We don't have that. But what we do have, and something, for, uh, I'll, I'll give you one example in terms of a partnership, is one of the options we're looking at is partnering with amateur radio operators, of which there are quite a number in Cote St. Luke, and looking at how the city can support the, for example, the, 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 the ongoing the, the support of, you know, for example, a ham radio club where we could use their technology to augment our own. So uh, maybe not a radio station, but again, it's different ways that we're, that we're exploring because, like I said, there's no one-size-fits-all one solution. So we're really trying to, to, to cover as many different uh, possibilities. Yes, sir. Oh, sorry, yes. We for, and, and like the mayor said, for larger events, the Centre de Sécurité Civile, the, the Civil Protection Bureau, which is under the responsi responsibility of the Montreal Fire Department, has in their dispatch center, which is on Park Avenue, the ability to interrupt every radio f frequency in, Mo in the Montreal region to broadcast an emergency message. So it's not something that chances are, and like the mayor said, it's not something that because there's a small incident in Cote Saint-Luc they're going to do. When it's a, the big one, we, have, we, through our partners, through the agglomeration, have the ability to do that. So that does exist.